Okay, so here for this one, we have the Athletics' Tim Spears and also Arsenal writer James McNicholas as well. Well, the Ben White story uh, broke late last week and now the dust has settled, I think is a really good time to get into it. Uh, Tim, let's start with you on this one. Um, just remind listeners exactly what Gareth Southgate said last week. Yeah, it's been it's been a sort of element of confusion as to why Ben White hasn't been involved since, since Qatar, but Southgate felt like uh, last week was the right time to address it. And, you know, he certainly did. I th everyone was pretty surprised with how sort of strong he was on the subject. He basically said, um, clearly on form, I can't sit here and say that Ben White doesn't deserve to be involved. And then he went on to uh, describe how Edu from Arsenal contacted John McDermott at England to say that Ben White doesn't want to be considered for England at the moment. Uh, he called it a great shame. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a surprise, this, actually. I don't know if, if sort of Southgate has thrown him under the bus with these comments or if White knew that they were coming. Um, I, sus I suspect the fact that he's detailed how the communication was made um, is very pointed. And, you know, it's not Ben White calling Southgate himself mm -hmm. to tell him. Um, I suspect that that's annoyed Southgate and maybe has led him to to sort of go public with this because he's the one that obviously has to answer constantly why Ben White isn't in the squad. So he's done that and it's uh, yeah become a pretty big issue. Yeah, James, this kind of goes back to, to the Qatar World Cup, doesn't it? I think Ben White left under personal reasons. That, that, they, that was, the, I guess, the official term, wasn't it? Yeah, I think, to be honest, you may have to look back even further than that, really, to the start of this story, which is, Ben White winning his first call-up for the England senior team. And if you look at Ben White's social media at the time, he was over the moon about it. So I think this idea that he's a guy who's never had any interest in international football or playing for England is wrong. You know, I think, I think it's something that I think he said he always dreamed about as a kid. Then he went, of course, to the Euros, didn't get a kick at that tournament, uh, which I think was a quite a frustrating experience for him. And then obviously we get to the World Cup. Um, and that's where there's a kind of uh, different opinion, you know, depending on who you listen to about what exactly happened there. But uh, Danny Taylor and Jack Pitbrook wrote a great piece about Ben White and England for The Athletic. And that described, you know, some of the events that led to him ultimately deciding to leave the squad for, as you mentioned, personal reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the biggest bones of contention is about whether or not uh, Gareth Southgate's assistant, Steve Holland, is related to this issue and, and our understanding is that he was there was a an angry exchange of words it happened in front of the squad so there are witnesses to that and that played its part in Ben White's decision to leave but I think there were other factors as well you know as we say wasn't playing didn't necessarily feel particularly involved part of the group wasn't a great traveler as they say in sort of mm -hmm. uh, football colloquialisms and uh, yeah so I think there's a personal dynamic to it all as well but he, he wanted to leave and clearly doesn't really want to be part of this squad under this manager right now. Yeah, and just to add, Steve Holland has denied those allegations. Tim, we're going to go into sort of what this feels like for football fans in general and some of the conversations that have happened around it a, a little later on. But I, I guess something the press and also football fans keep going back to is that interview he did with Sky a little while ago um, when he sort of spoke about, didn't really watch football when he was younger. You know, he, of course he carried on and said, I just loved the game. But you can understand why there's this bit of furore around it that he sort of doesn't care, does he? You're not allowed to say that. Are you? You're not allowed to say that, that you don't watch football in, in your spare time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the, I mean, there's 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 a lot of strands to this. Uh, and that, you, the, He's not the first to come out and say that, that he doesn't particularly like uh, watching football in his spare time. David Batty was one that I always sort of remember. But there's others, even someone like Gabriel Batistuta mm. um, said he just... What, very... a great goal scorer well, exactly, Batistuta? Yeah. yeah, he said it, it was, you know, his profession. And, and again, watching football in his spare time uh, wasn't something he liked to do. Benoit Asuakotu was another mm. example. Um, the best, my favourite story about him is that when Rafa van der Vaart turned up at Spurs, he apparently Asuakotu didn't even know who he was. Uh, which I find crazy. I guess, you know, you can... You can discuss the merits of watching football in your spare time all you mm. like, but if you don't know who the players are in your the, the excellent players are in your field of work, sort of whatever job you do is a bit strange. Um, yeah, I think um, I think everyone can sort of relate to that to not not wanting your job to consume your life, mm. sort of whatever walk of life you, you're in. Um, and so I, I, I I don't decry him for that if uh, if he doesn't like watching. You know, Luton v Nottingham Forest on a on a Wednesday night, then you know, so be it. Yeah, I mean. Following on to that, James, I, I guess 
in every other job, this seems okay. But for some reason, as football fans, we look at, you know, some of our heroes and go, why wouldn't you want to play for your national team? You're a professional, mate. Come on. This is this is the pinnacle of football. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Although I do think attitudes are shifting in that respect. I mean, maybe it's partly because Arsenal and the Premier League are so international now. You know, a great many of their fans are outside of the UK. You know, they have no affiliation whatsoever to the England team. So it's been really interesting for me, kind of having written about Ben White and talking to people on social media. I think a lot of Arsenal fans are club over country at this point in time. And they'll they'll be relieved, if anything, that Ben White's not going away with England and risking injury. I think that they're perfectly, perfectly happy with that. I haven't seen many Arsenal fans come out and say they take issue with it. Obviously, wider Premier League fans, maybe so. But even then, and I might be wrong on this, but I get the sense that attitudes around this have shifted quite a lot over the last 10 to 20 years. You know, if we, if it's 20 years ago and Ben White said, I don't want to play for England, I think it would have received a very different reaction. And in fact, people who have come out and heavily criticised for, for him for it, that are often from a kind of an older generation. You know, I saw Harry Redknapp spoke quite strongly on it. Yeah. But again, you know, he belongs to a slightly different era in terms of English football. So I hope that people's attitudes are softening a bit because ultimately, you know, it's Ben White's decision whether he wants to play for England or not at this particular time. And I say at this particular time quite pointedly because I, I wouldn't preclude him ever playing for England again. I think it's entirely possible that under another manager in a different regime, he would want to be there and he would be considered for selection. But it, it's at this present moment that he doesn't want to play. Yeah, I want to dig deep into this a little, a little later on, but let, let's move on to Ben White, you know, at Arsenal, um, James, because, you know, I don't know if it was coincidental, but uh, it was revealed that uh, he signed a, a new deal at Arsenal and uh, accompanying it, Quite a, a congratulatory, celebratory social media campaign um, from all his teammates as well. I, I think it feels a little too coincidental, like you suggest. Uh, I, I don't think that timing is down to chance because Ben White agreed this contract with Arsenal some time ago. Mm. And then lo and behold, it's announced uh, on the day that I think you know there was an awareness that Gareth Southgate might well be addressing the situation in his press conference. And Arsenal, of course, knew Ben White's decision, having mm. had Edu, the sporting director, communicate it to England. But I found this video really interesting. It was it was a nice way of doing a contract renewal and I think gave people outside the club a bit of an insight into Ben White, the character, because it seems to me there are a lot of misconceptions around Ben White and, and maybe some quite lazy stereotyping. I think he would say himself, you know, he's got a certain look, he's got the tan, he's got the tattoos, he's got this sort of inherently nonchalant attitude and he said some of the things he said in the past. He's not someone who kind of does interviews by the book. You know, he's very, very frank. And, you know, one of those comments that he doesn't watch football is, is going to follow him probably for the rest mm. of his career. But the contradiction there is when you speak to people who work with him every day at Arsenal. And, you know, the first word a lot of those players in that video used was warrior to describe him, which, again, sits completely at odds with the image that I think is projected around him quite often. Everybody who works with him speaks about his work rate, his attention to detail, the, the fact that he's prepared to do all the analysis that is asked of him. You know, effectively, he's learned a new position over the last 12 months or so, playing as a right back. He's been educated on that position by Mikel Arteta and his staff. He's taken everything on board. In fact, he's one of those players who, if you give him videos to watch of his direct opponent in a game, he will soak all that up. He wants that information because he's driven to be the best in his given position. Uh, he's got enormous drive. So it, it is fascinating, this character who seems to be incredibly dedicated in his professional life, but then wants to switch off outside of that. I mean, it, it, it reminds you me of the saying, if your hobby becomes your job, get a new hobby. Yeah. Uh, and clearly that's what Ben White's doing. But I think he is a really good pro underneath that. And I, I'm glad actually that Arsenal were able to foreground that with the contract announcement, because uh, as I say, I think, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about this player. Yeah, James talks about attention to detail, Tim. Um, in his piece, he also, James highlights, you know, the contractual talks and and what went into that, you know, Ben's team, oh, I've got that attention to detail. You know, it says Ben White's representatives commissioned a report from data-driven sports consultancy analytics FC. The in-depth documented highlighted how White has excelled as a fullback and a centre back, as well as identifying some of his stronger attributes. Obviously, goes on to other stuff, but they built up a case as to why this player needs to stay at Arsenal. Is that 
something that's quite common in contractual conversations yeah ab absolutely yeah in terms of um data and analytics that's, that's that becomes very common now in sort of justifying these type of things and yeah he's i mean he's, as james is saying he's become one of the most effective you, you don't play for a team at the top of the premier league and in the last day of the champions mm -hmm. league without being one of the best in europe right and he's he's excelled at right back and you don't become an excellent right back in a new position by not being yet yeah, extremely driven and working extremely hard. Um, he looked sort of uncomfortable there when he first moved to right back, but he certainly doesn't now. And his partnership with Saka has got to be one of the best in the league, really. And then he's also got the, the fact he can play at uh, a centre back. He was always considered a future centre back, even in his sort of when he went down to Leeds in 1920 season on loan. Um, and at Brighton, you know, he was always, I remember speaking to people. At the time, in terms of the next centre backs coming through, he was always considered that he would play centre back mm -hmm. for England. But I guess when you when you're told that when you're a young lad um, that you will play for England one day, and then once you get into the setup, you find that you're barely getting any minutes. You can see why that will be part of his frustration and what's you know a pretty complicated situation. But that must be a key part of it. Yeah, for sure. I'm just thinking about what James is saying about the outside, what we see of Ben White versus. The actual well, that's really, it's really, it's really interesting. interesting. Someone, like, someone like Matt Doherty at, at Wolves and Spurs, he's so, so incredibly laid back to mm. the point where people find it really annoying. He will never go and sort of clap the fans at full time or do a big sort of tub thumping interview mm. pre, pre or post match. But, you know, no one will work as hard as him. You don't get to the top of your game, certainly with all due respect to Matt, someone with his with his sort of talent level, you don't get mm. to where he does without working extremely hard. There are, you know, there are all sorts of sort of misconceptions around football. So Dharma Traor is another one, he, you know, because of the the hair, the earrings. The muscles. The muscles, yeah. the fact he's oiled up. People think he's like really flash, but mm. he's honestly one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life. Mm. Um, it's really interesting that it's a sort of, because football is, uh, it's basically a performance, right? You're out there at the Emirates every week for Ben White performing in front of 60,000 people. So I think, people assume a degree of like extroversion in players' personalities, but it's often mm. not the case. You know, you get a lot of these guys who are just fundamentally more introverted. And and Ben, as far as I understand, is just one of those. Yeah, I guess I wonder if this plays into the hands of, I guess a footballer now is, is expected to be a brand. A footballer now is expected to have a voice, say the Marcus Rashford's in this world or whatever. And actually there are others who don't fit that mould. And just before the podcast, me and James were, were talking, Tim, and just saying, actually, we don't all have to fit into that mould. We are still professionals in our own right. And that is the same in any workspace. Yeah, and you don't and you don't you don't have to be like obsessed with football mm. by any means. You know, I I I love and adore my job. I'm I'm incredibly grateful <laughs> and privileged to be a journalist. But you know, it's never felt like work to me. But when it comes to sort of spare time, you know, mm. I'm not gonna sit down and watch Burnley v Reading on a Tuesday night unless I have to, I do you know what I mean? Um so it's difficult for fans to sort of relate to that mm. in terms of football's an escape for for most of them and an escape from their from their from their working mm. week. Um, but there'll be loads more footballers who feel this way and just don't say it because it's 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 a difficult thing for fans to get their head around. I think. Yeah, and James, very quickly on sort of Ben White's development at Arsenal. Um, I've only just realised this, but like, he's also incredibly durable uh, as a player. I mean, it's the last time Ben White was injured. Yeah, well, touch wood. I mean, he has been incredibly durable. The truth is he's been injured for much of this season. Mm -hmm. He's been carrying a knee problem and he's been playing anyway. Uh, he is known within the dressing room to be one of the toughest guys out there. I think there was an away game at Newcastle during the run-in a couple of seasons ago, his first season at the club, where he played with a pretty significant mm -hmm. hamstring tear. Um, and I think his teammates marvelled at it. He's basically on one leg, uh, but Arsenal were short of defenders and he was prepared to go out there and play, strapped up. It's almost at the point where, you know, the, the staff have to watch Ben White very carefully because he doesn't actually like to communicate with them when he's got a problem because he wants <laughs> right. to play. Whatever the circumstances, he wants to play. And Mikel Arteta earlier this season, there was a moment where he said, look, we spotted something on Ben in training and we rested him for a game because there was no way that he was going to tell us himself. I think the Arteta point, by the way, just on the subject of mm -hmm. Ben's character, his professionalism, his application, is an interesting one because we know it's one of the things we know about Mikel Arteta, how exacting he is in terms of his demands, his standards, his non-negotiables, as he calls them. And we know how many players have fallen foul of those over the years. People like Meza Ozil, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, Genduzi would be another one. 
he simply would not indulge Ben White if he was anything other than a top pro. And when you saw Ben White's contract signing, it's clear how much love there is between Edu, Arteta and White. I think he's he's really kind of an archetypal Arteta player in some mm-hmm. respects. And uh, yeah, he clearly absolutely loves him. And, and maybe that's, again, a point to make about England that so much of the time, this is just about chemistry between a player and a coach and mm-hmm. a setup. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that isn't right. You know, Mesut Ozil was a great player. Pierre Emerick Aubameyang was a great player, but they weren't right for the project that Arteta was was building. And maybe in that same way, the chemistry just isn't right between Southgate and White. And that's what happens in club football all the time. So why should it be a surprise when it happens in international football as well? Yeah. James, can I just ask, from Arsenal's point of view, what, what do you think the motivation was behind putting the contract announcement on that day? Because it definitely... It definitely pours fuel on the fire, doesn't it? Mm. I think I would imagine the intention, and I don't know this, but my I'd imagine what it would be to kind of give Ben White support and a feeling of Arsenal being a kind of refuge for him from the England situation, as it has been throughout this. You know, when he left the World Cup, uh, he came back to training with Arsenal and there were a lot of supportive messages from Arsenal on social media and Mikel Arteta came out and said, you know, we need to put our arms around him effectively as a club. I imagine that that was a big part of, of what they were doing. And, and to be honest, if Gareth Southgate had not addressed the issue head on, maybe, you know, that would have worked. As you say, it all kind of blew up uh, on the day. Um but Arsenal will continue to represent that for Ben White. And in these contract negotiations, he was very clear that was where he wanted to be. As much as he hasn't necessarily enjoyed his football with England in the past, he absolutely loves his football with Arsenal. So, you know, as as I say, the Arsenal fans will probably feel pretty content with that situation. I'll be interested to see what sort of reception Ben White gets Mm. Uh, upcoming Premier League games. I mean, do you think this is something that he'll carry with him? Is it something fans are going to chant about in the stands. This is a, a really interesting question I was having earlier is that maybe I'm naive in this, but I can't see fans necessarily booing him because he didn't choose to play for England. Are we, I mean, or, or perhaps it's back to the generational conversation. I mean, there's a very interesting uh, current example with Jordan Henderson, who I watched uh-huh. and booed and castigated at Villa Park last mm. week. Villa was celebrating one of the greatest European nights in their mm. recent history. And the majority of the songs on that evening were about were aimed at Jordan Henderson, none of which I can repeat mm. at this moment in time, which I just I just found bizarre because no one would want to play for for England pretty much more than Jordan Henderson. Mm. So in terms of in terms of his commitment, um, that's undeniable. But yeah, in terms of Ben White, I, don't, I no, I don't see it happening. But is the storyline not slightly different with Jordan Henderson versus Ben no, White? No, of, of course it is. Of course it is. But I, I don't see Ben White as a particularly polarizing mm. figure. I don't think he would make people angry. I think people would be a little bit bemused about his about him not wanting to be available for selection at this time. But he's certainly not the first. By the way, <laughs> there, the, the, yeah. the, there are quite a few even in recent history mm. in terms of in terms of not wanting to play. And I think people will see the fact that. He's lining up and playing very well for Arsenal week after week and not getting a kick for England and probably feel a bit of sympathy towards him. Yeah. Um, on that note, do you think, I mean, Gareth Southgate did say it, but do you genuinely think that the door is still open for England? I mean... Under I think, a different coach, for instance. It's clearly gone for the Euros. Yeah. There's no way he's going to go to the Euros now, you know, at, at this late stage. Um, but yeah, in terms of that, in terms of the right-back position, Trippier's 33, uh, Walker's 33, Reese James, obviously very injury-prone. Trent Alexander-Arnold been classed as a midfielder for England at the recent times he's been called up. So, yeah, potentially um, looking towards 2026, 2028. Mm. You'd, you'd imagine so. He'd be, in, he'd be in most people's 23s right now. I think he'd be in Gareth Southgate's 23 for the mm. Euros, all things considered. Um, looking to the future, I'd probably be looking maybe more at centre-back. Okay. I think um, under the current manager, you know, Harry Maguire is, uh, is, is a guaranteed pick. But under the next manager, that might not be the case. Mm. And the next manager might see John Stones as a midfielder, for example. And there's there's a underneath Maguire and Stones, you've got a number of players who are sort of pushing through, but not sort of guaranteed to be an England centre back in the coming years. People like Lewis Dunk, in terms of age, is a bit of a stopgap. Mark Gay, I think, is someone who probably needs to improve. Esri Concer as well. Uh, Branthwaite, we'll see. Levi Colwell will see, but Ben White, I think, is someone who you who you could pinpoint as being a centre back for England in the coming years. Um, 
So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. I think it would probably have to be a change of manager at this point, but that will probably happen this summer, I'd imagine. Well, this brings me on to an interesting point because there are some people who are not happy with Ben White not wanting to play for England. James, why do you think Ben White not playing for England makes people so upset? I think some people see it as a kind of dereliction of duty, don't they? I, I think that um, there is this idea of almost it's a, not only is it an honour, to play for England, but it's a duty as well. You're representing your country, your nation. You're being called up. Even the language uh, has a kind of militaristic slant Mm. to it at times. So I I think that is, you know, part of the conversation around it and and where a lot of it comes from. But as I say, I do feel that attitudes are shifting on that. And I think in general, you know, club football is kind of superseding international football in so many ways that – I think people's loyalties are different now. Everybody rallies around England for a big tournament, right? We know in this country how much we love getting behind the three Lions, you know, when a big tournament comes up. But in the course of a season, I think people are thinking more about their clubs. I don't think they get excited enough about friendlies or qualifiers to really be too bothered about, you know, who and who isn't, who isn't selected for the national team. Um but yeah, it, it's yeah. There will be people, I'm sure, listening who disagree with that and who think that what Ben White's done is fundamentally wrong. You know that in some respects he's let his country down. I'm sure is you know an opinion that exists out there. I just think that may be a little antiquated um, when you look at kind of the landscape of the uh, the contemporary game. Mm, you, you buy that? It's, def- it's definitely lost its allure. I think from like I don't know the 50s to the. So the 90s, it's sort of the undeniable pinnacle of a player's career. Sort of, yeah, as James says, post-war, army style, representing your nation, coming up and singing the national anthem, and you've got to sing it loudly. You know, you can't you can't, you can't, can't not sing it like Gary Neville. That's, that's heresy. But, but times have changed, I think. And um, as James says, you know, the, the Champions League's overtaken international football in terms of, in terms of quality. So it, it's not the undeniable pinnacle of a player's career anymore. Um, and for guys at the top of the Premier League or in the Champions League, um, it's not as important as it used to be. Um, the tournaments are still incredibly important, but um, things are becoming more irksome. Not just not just footballers, but also to fans. You know, the June internationals in a non-tournament year, for example, mm. or the March internationals in a non-tournament year, are just seen as pretty pointless by almost everybody involved now. I think fans would say the same as that in terms of being boring to watch. And I'm sure the I'm sure the players there's an element of that for the players as well. Yeah, James, I'm also thinking. You know, if you're lucky enough to play for a top team like Arsenal or, you know, uh, Manchester City and you, you get your England call up. I mean, just that thought of having to travel all year round anyway. And then you've got this summer again where you're having to travel away, maybe being away from family. And actually, some people might just want to rest. <laughs> some people might just want to be around their loved ones. I'm just thinking from a human perspective. Yeah, I mean, Ben White is, is you know, a recently married man. Is obviously like very dedicated to his partner and that's what he does in his private time spends time with her walks his dog and if he wants to do more of that in the summer can I, can I really blame him for that absolutely not I, it's an interesting one isn't it i think maybe it's frank lampard who has spoken about england duty previously as kind of almost being in a sort of gilded cage mm-hmm. you know you're you're in this hotel and if you're part of that very very strict regime you know training early bed you can't leave the hotel you don't have the freedom to go where you want and you're not playing i can see how that might become tiresome quite quickly and your relatively short time off in the summer evaporates so look personally you know and i'm I'm known to be an arsenal fan so it won't surprise anybody here but I, i do have a great deal of sympathy with ben white in this position because i think really for me the question is should he have earned minutes before should he have earned more minutes than he did and he didn't you know I I think it was very clear to him he wasn't one of Gareth Southgate's guys you know one of his key players he didn't envisage an important role for him in the squad so I can understand feeling a bit dejected by that and thinking maybe there are better ways to spend your time I think it depends it depends on your mentality and also where you're at in your career I think Mm. um we did a piece about not playing at tournaments a couple of years ago at the Athletic um I was surprised to see the figure that more than 150 players didn't kick a ball in Qatar. Wow, that's a There's, lot. It's a, it, it is a lot. And I think, yeah, it, it does depend on your mentality. Stephen Warnock was interviewed for the piece and he said when he went in 2010, I think it was, he knew he was a backup to Ashley Cole mm-hmm. and that the likelihood was he wasn't going to kick a minute. I think you get the same, obviously, for a lot of backup goalkeepers as well. He called it 
he he said it was great. He said it was the front seat to a World Cup, and he he just loved being part of that experience. And Connor Cody, like Ben White, didn't play a minute at the Euros or the World Cup. I'm sure he'd tell you, you know, exactly the same. Um, frustrating not to play, yes, but an honour to be there. He very much embraced that supporting role, mm. uh, big personality around the camp, helped others, saw it as his duty to sort of push and help his teammates. And Steve Holland, by contrast, said uh, he was the player of the tournament at the Euros because of what he did sort of behind the scenes. Um, obviously, Ben White isn't content playing that role. Um, certainly seems so. It could be an ego thing. Could just be boredom. You know, it's, it's weeks of watching TV and, and playing table tennis. Mm. You can't go out. It's not like it's the eighties where you where you can just go out for a for a squad knees up. Mm. You know. Um so I guess if if you don't play and your team fails, you'll be like, that was just a waste of a month mm. when I could have been doing something with my many millions of pounds and, you know, my beautiful family and, and mm. whatever. But even even if the team is successful, you'll be like, Well, I wasn't part of it. So uh, it's I'm not I can't enjoy this. So I I could certainly get it. Um Muzzy Is it was a good case study, which again was a pick, picked up in this piece that we did. He didn't play a minute for Turkey in two thousand and two when he got called up to that tournament. There's an extract from his book kind of saying how utterly miserable he was. He just wanted to go home. But then in the semi final against Brazil, uh he got an unexpected call to play the last seventeen minutes against Roberto Carlos. So he said it was all completely worth it because <laughs> he can tell anyone, well, I played... I played against Big Roberto Carlos. Yeah, in a yeah. World Cup semi-final against Brazil. So that's another way of looking at it is that, and that's, I don't know, you can imagine Roy Keane would say that, right? You've got to be a professional, bide your time. Um, all it takes is one injury and then then and then you never know. All it takes maybe an injury to Carl Walker and, and yeah. Ben White's playing in a Euros for England. So that's the other way of looking at it. That, that's an interesting point. Yeah, just, yes. I, was think, I was just thinking of Roy Keane then, an interesting point there, because I do think so much of it is personality type, like you say, Tim. Mm. I mean, if it was Roy Keane being told, actually, mate, you're not going to play for three or four games, you could see him potentially walking out. I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to ego, how players see themselves, what they envisage their role in the team being. I mean, look at Aaron Ramsdale. Gareth Southgate's picked him for this squad. He's not even playing for Arsenal at the present point in time. Presumably that's because he knows, you know, Jordan Pickford's my number one, but I need a guy who's going to be a good training goalkeeper, who's going to support Jordan, going to be prepared to be a backup. And he's selected him, I suppose, in some respects. He's had the, the perfect season preparing for that Euros, being behind the David Raya in the pecking order yeah. at Arsenal. But... You know, you do need those guys, the Cody's, um, the Ramsdales, the players who aren't going to play but are going to support the group. Yeah, and and Ben White, you know, clearly is not seen as one of those guys. I think as well, there's a social dynamic to every England squad. For a lot of these players, they're meeting up with their mates. You know, these are guys who they came through playing youth internationals with or, you know, have played together at previous clubs and it's an opportunity to hang out. I don't think Ben White is someone who necessarily has those social ties in the mm. current group. So I think joining up with England, it doesn't have this kind of social allure it might for certain other players in that squad. I just want to ask the two of you this before we finish. You know, I think about playing for managers like Jurgen Klopp, Guardiola, you could put Arteta in the mix in terms of intensity anyway. Do you think for players like Ben White, perhaps playing for England, it's quite a drop off from that? Yeah, I wrote a piece about this last year in terms of Southgate as well and how the squad had maybe overtaken him a little bit in terms of the transfers we saw last summer. Kane going up a level to Bayern Munich, Bellingham going up a level to Real Madrid, uh, Declan Rice, of course, going from West Ham to Arsenal, James Madison going from Leicester to Spurs. And it sort of felt like they're all playing for tactically exceptional managers mm -hmm. for their clubs. And Southgate's obviously got strengths in other areas. This isn't to, to demean him as a as a manager, you know, in terms of his man management, his his intelligence, the way he's created this 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 cohesive team, and obviously been very successful with England from where they were, you know, for the decade previously. But in terms of tactical brilliance, you know, and you'll find this across Europe. You know, the best managers aren't in international mm. football these days. I guess that would definitely be part of seeing it as a step down for sure. Do you, th do you see that, James? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking of Ben White. He's got his first Champions League quarterfinal coming up against Bayern Munich. And, you know, I think he probably will see that as the highest level of the game at this point in time. Um, and that's absolutely where his focus will be. It's an interesting point about Southgate and it's going to be fascinating. I think that's one of the most fascinating things to watch this summer. If he does leave England, you know, where does a manager like Gareth Southgate land? Probably the most successful England manager in modern times. Uh and yet, where would he go in? 
at club level, I think that would show you maybe the disparity that is emerging between international football and club football. But if Carl Walker breaks his metatarsal in May, <laughs> yeah. Right? Right, <laughs> right it'll, it'll just happen. open the door for just go to tell, just go to Ben's house right now and say, Ben, you might still have a no, but imagine. <laughs> and then, and then Harry Kane le- leads England to yeah. glory in Germany, and Ben White, he's, he's not going to get called up because mm. he's already said he's not going to play. He, he would rue that for the rest of his life. Mm, very true. Let's end it there. Cheers, gents, for your time, Tim, James. Uh, don't forget to rate and review the podcast. We will be back tomorrow for more. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>